So as Katie said, the theme for this month is wholeness. And if we're gonna talk about wholeness, I think we need to talk about what it means to be broken. For too often these two concepts are held in juxtaposition to one another when really they're deeply intertwined. And we need to distinguish between what it means to be broken versus broken open. To be broken implies that something or someone needs fixing. That being broken is somehow a lesser state, like a toy that's been overly loved or a window that someone has thrown a rock through. They need to and they can be repaired. It is assumed that they will return to their intended original whole state. And then they're the things that get broken, that can't be fixed or returned to their original state. Mended, perhaps, but forever altered. One's heart or a physical violation of one's body. But to be broken open is different from being broken. It implies that that which has been shuttered or hidden or unknown is made known. To have one's heart broken open may be to have its hardness softened, its compassion unloosed. It may be to let in that which we have kept at bay out of fear or past hurt. It may be the result of a cataclysmic event such as a death, or it may be the result of something quite small, like a child reaching for your hand. That utter innocent trust, melting your own cynicism and reticence. The Reverend Thomas Rhodes wrote a meditation on broken and whole hearts, and this is what he had to say. And how is it with your heart? Does your heart feel whole, shielded by intellect, cocooned by reason, closed to feeling? Or has your heart been broken and healed so many times that it now lies open to the world that we may carry the hearts of others? So Rhodes describes perfect for perfectly for me what one of my professors in seminary, the Catholic priest Henry Nouwen called the wounded healer. And Nouwen says that wounded healers offer their hurts to help others receive comfort and encouragement. And though this idea of the wounded healer is attributed to Nouwen, it, it comes also from Carl Jung in his relooking at the myth of the centaur, Chiron, who had the upper body of a human and the lower body of a horse. Chiron possessed a knowledge of medicine and was wise and nurturing and was famous for his healing powers, yet Chiron had a wound that never healed. And it was that wound in him that created his knowledge, his compassion, his ability to heal others. And again, I want to say that wholeness is not perfection. The Quaker educator and writer Parker Palmer says, wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Knowing this gives me hope that human wholeness, mine, yours, and ours, need not be a utopian dream if we can use devastation as a seedbed for new life. He goes on to say, if I am to let my life speak things I want to hear, I must also let it speak things I do not want to hear and would never tell anyone else. My life is not only about my strengths and virtues, it's also about my liabilities and my limits, my trespasses and my shadow. An inevitable, though often ignored dimension 
of the quest for wholeness is that we must embrace what we dislike or find shameful about ourselves as well as what we are confident or proud of. So I think what Parker and Nowen are saying is that it is our brokenness and our strengths that create our wholeness. That our wholeness is not whole unless it has been tried by things that have broken us down and open. When we are laid open, laid raw, we are fertile ground for something else to begin to manifest. And wholeness is the ability to integrate the parts of ourselves with some modicum of acceptance and affirmation. When we're in a crisis or a situation where our world has been turned on its head, when our universe has been torn apart, we don't find comfort in platitudes or from those who speak about that which they do not know. What we need are those who have had their own lives broken open and reconfigured. Several congregations ago, I decided to set up a lay pastoral associate program. Lay pastoral associates aren't trained or licensed. They're not therapists. They're not counselors. They are folks who simply accompany you in a time-limited way as you sort through life issues, feelings, or problems. They don't give you advice. They hold the mirror up that you may be able to see yourself more clearly. And if what you are dealing with is more than what they know how to hold, they will refer you to an appropriate professional. Theirs is a ministry of presence, of connection and compassion. By meeting with any of you, they are letting you know that you're not alone, that you're connected to this larger community of care and compassion. So I didn't ask the counselors, the therapists, and the psychiatrists in that congregation to serve as lay pastoral associates. I don't believe in asking people to volunteer their professional skills for the church unless they offer to do so. Everyone needs a break, right? When I started asking people to be a lay pastoral associate, many of them were surprised that I had asked them. Why? Because they didn't see themselves as having it all together, which is precisely why I asked them. So think about it. When you're going through something, do you want someone who's led a Pollyanna-like existence to talk with? or someone who has been there, someone whose words are words of knowledge and empathy, someone who has been where you are and has found their way to another side. So I asked a man who was going through his third divorce, a woman who had had a total mental breakdown as an adult as she came to terms with her childhood sexual abuse a man in recovery from alcoholism, a person who was part of a Buddhist recovery program for families of addicts, a woman who had survived cancer twice, someone who had been a single parent struggling to make ends meet. I chose these people because they were not perfect, but because they had found their way to wholeness with the scars still showing. Looking in from the outside, one could see only the brokenness these folks had endured, or you could look at them and see the wholeness they had found by learning to live with the pieces of themselves that had experienced brokenness. Again, words from Leonard Cohen who says, I've been where you're hanging and I think I can see how you're pinned. The next line is, when you're not feeling lonely, Wait, when you're not feeling holy, your loneliness says that you've sinned. Forget that line. Just remember the first part. <laughs> I've been where you're hanging, and I think I can see how you're pinned. He's also the one who wrote that cracks are how the light gets in. And when I'm experiencing my own brokenness, I want folks who have been where I'm hanging and can see how I'm pinned. I also want folks around me 
who view the cracks of my life as an openness, places where light illuminates, someone or someones who affirm that my broken pieces are more than rubble. Indeed, they are the very foundation of my life. Let me give you another example of how brokenness, supposed brokenness, creates the possibility for strength. Years ago, I heated exclusively with wood. I had bought a fireplace insert, and in that there was a stove pipe that was hooked up to that. And one day I noticed that they had separated from one another. So I called the shop where I bought it, and I said, we got a problem. You need to replace this stove. And they said, no, 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 we should weld it. And I was like, oh no, this is under warranty. You're gonna replace it, which they did. And a couple of months later, guess what happened? <laughs> so I called them back, this time being open and listening to what the man had to say. And they came back and they welded it together. And what the man said to me is that the weld actually makes it stronger. And what I've learned from that <laughs> is that something that has been broken and repaired can often be stronger. I apply that to relationships of all kinds. Because the relationships are only real when we stop idealizing the other, when the honeymoon is over and you see who that person really is, maybe the relationship gets fractured in some way. But a relationship is stronger after it has endured something of a challenge. Again, it doesn't necessarily return to what it was, but it is now deeper, not less than. It is not restored to its previous state, but it is rather reorganized. Reorganized into a new strength, a new wholeness that incorporates that brokenness. That stovepipe never separated from the insert again. Now think about wholeness in our culture and how it is presented. It is definitely identified with perfection and idealized notions to, of what it means to be a human being. And that human being weighs exactly, or a little bit less, what they are supposed to weigh according to the insurance charts. <laughs> no, I don't take any issue with that at all. <laughs> that person is fit because their electronic organizer has found room for all those yoga and spin classes. They eat healthy. They eat wholesome, organic, sustainably sourced local foods. They have a community. They have great friendships. They're financially solvent. They're highly educated. They're a white collar professional with homes and garden homes, overachieving children, and a successful partner and a happy partnership. It's the modern day version of Leave it to Beaver. To me, that screams brokenness, but what do I know? But what is more important is that anyone who doesn't fit that image is less than, is othered, is not broken open, but looked at as broken and in need of fixing, which means that almost all of us are wondering if we're ever gonna measure up. And the disability community takes issue with this notion of wholeness. When you encounter or interact with someone in a wheelchair or someone who's using crutches or someone who's speaking in sign language or someone who is blind or someone who has cerebral palsy or is neurotypically different, how do you, quote, see them? As less than whole? As someone to be pitied? As someone who's missing out in some way? Do you want to help take care of them? Are you patronizing? Do you jump in to help? In 2006, there was a controversy after the hiring of a hearing person to be the dean at Gallaudet University in DC. Why? Because since its inception in 1856, Gallaudet was specifically a university for deaf blind and hard of hearing. The students wanted a deaf person to be their dean. And of course, 60 Minutes picked this up and they did an interview with one of the acting administrators who is a deaf man and the interviewer, you could just see her not getting this and she just said, but, don't, but wouldn't you want to be hearing? You're missing so much. He was very gracious and he responded, no. 
he explained that his life was full just as it was, deaf. He did not perceive himself as less than whole. It was the interviewer that did. And the same goes for people who are in wheelchairs, or present as other than the idealized mode of physical or mental wholeness. In addition, those of us who are hear me now temporarily able-bodied sometimes find ourselves uncomfortable around persons who are disabled. If they have an aid, we may find ourselves talking to the aid about the person who is sitting right there, objectifying that person. We don't know how to interact with them which leaves them isolated, othered, and often an invisible. And so who gets to decide who is physically or mentally whole? Do you remember the story that Katie told this morning? She wrote that story. And it's based on a Japanese art form called kintsugi. It is a Japanese art of fixing broken pottery with a lacquer that contains gold silver, or platinum. And broken seams are filled with that lacquer. And they say about this technique that this repair method celebrates each artifact's unique history by emphasizing its fractures in breaks instead of hiding or disguising them. This art form, kintsugi, dates back to the 15th century when a Japanese shogun sent a teapot to China to be repaired, and when it returned, it was full of metal staples that rendered the cup, quote, rather ugly. So the craftspeople decided to experiment and see what they could do to find a, quote, more acceptable repair. And that's when Kintsugi was born. It was also influenced by a prevalent philosophy of the time two particular ones, one called wabi-sabi, which means, which calls for seeing beauty in the flawed imperfection. For seeing beauty in the flawed imperfection. This method also aligns with other feelings. One is regret when something is wasted, and two, the acceptance of change. I would not call that which is imperfect flawed, rather, I would talk about the imperfection or cracks the way that Leonard Cohen does, the places where the light gets in. So what if, when it comes to wholeness, we talk about the ways brokenness allows us to be not perfect, but whole? What if it is the sharing of what has created the scars we wear physically, metaphorically, emotionally and psychically that allows us to, quote, carry the hearts of others? What if we shared our woundedness in the places we have been broken open, as well as the places where we have been healed? What if we looked upon all of that the way that the Japanese art of Kintsugi renders that which is perceived as broken, as a place of beauty, a place that is not wasted, a place that is open to and will allow change? What if the goal was not an unexamined wholeness, but a journey of finding ways to crack open wider? I think this is why our small group ministry groups are so well subscribed, because in a structured way, people build the trust and safety to get real with one another. It's what happens in the sister circles and in the men's group. Our plasticity melts away, and what is real is revealed. We come to these groups sometimes afraid to disclose, wondering what people will think of us, or how they will relate to us from now on if they really know this part of me that I perceive as broken, the thing that shames me. Will we be seen as less than whole, or will our broken pieces be acknowledged as more than rubble? So here's what I'm hoping for this community, that we don't turn to one another and say, hey, how are you, and then just sort of turn on and keep going. But we ask this question instead, how is it with your heart? How is it with your heart? I want to end with a quote from a man named Alan Cohen, who I believe has 
written several interpretations of A Course in Miracles, and he says that those who love you are not fooled by mistakes you have made or dark images you hold against yourself. They remember your beauty when you feel ugly, your wholeness when you feel broken, your innocence when you feel guilty, and your purpose when you are confused. How is it with your hearts?